We're going to spend a little time tonight discussing the topic of forgiveness. Uh, the lesson will be something I think is very important for us to understand, and it's a big part of our Christian life is to understand forgiveness. I'll be citing passages from uh, an article that Wayne Jackson put together on this subject. So let's go to our Heavenly Father in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we're thankful for this day and opportunity we have to gather back today midweek as your family, and we pray that you'll bless our study tonight and help us to understand more about forgiveness and the importance of it, uh, the blesses, blessings that we receive from you uh, as far as our forgiveness is concerned. Help us, Father, to always strive to do your will, and we have a number of our people tonight that are dealing with illness, and we ask you to comfort and strengthen them, and turn them back uh, to our services on Sunday. These things we ask in Christ's name, amen. The word forgiveness probably stirs our hearts in a way that uh, will either help us or hinder us, but we'll be looking at what is made up of the topic of forgiveness. Forgiveness. Alexander Pope, a poet, said, To err is human, to forgive is the divine. So we'll probe this topic tonight from two basic standpoints. One, we'll call it divine forgiveness, which actually comes from God to man. And we'll look at human forgiveness that involves uh, extent between each one of us. Of course, there are some Greek words that are used, and I apologize because I'll probably just slay them uh, bad, but it's typical Greek words could mean different things than what we would think about in our English language. There may be uh, several words, and that's what we'll look at just short time, that mean uh, the idea of forgiveness that we have in our English language. One of these terms is a paris, literally meaning to send away. Uh, it has a variety of meanings uh, in the Greek language, but in, it's used some 36 times in the New Testament associated with the, the pardon of sins. If we look at Matthew 26, 28 as one example, for this is my blood of the covenant, which is to be shed on behalf of many for forgiveness of sins. Uh, the second uh, verse would be Acts 2, 38, when uh, Peter was said to them, repent, let each of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. So it's kind of a general idea of the parting of sins from God to man. Another word that's also used for forgiveness is, uh, this is even a harder word, charzonomai which signifies to bestow a favor or to show kindness. Romans 8.32, He did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all. How will he not also with him freely give us all things? So the idea of bestowing a favor or showing kindness is uh, another example of this word. Uh, 2 Corinthians, the second chapter, verse 7 says, so that on the contrary, you should rather forgive and comfort him. 
lest somehow such a one be overwhelmed in excessive sorrow. So again, another type of favor that's uh, bestowed on each other. And finally, in Colossians 3.13, bearing with one another and forgiving each other, whoever has a complaint against anyone, just as the Lord forgave you, so also should you. So we see these as words that are used in in light of uh, the word forgiveness from the English language. Paul used these terms uh, for forgiveness. Uh, he said we ought to extend to one another, and that we should be that which we would receive from Christ. There's a suggestion, just as the Lord graciously forgave us, we should wholeheartedly extend the same kindness to others. So that's kind of a basic concept of Christianity is the idea of forgiveness. We have, we receive forgiveness from God, but that's based on our ability to forgive each other. There's also uh, some figurative languages that are used in the Old Testament, uh, David praised uh, God for his loving kindness in Psalms 103.12. As far as the east is from the west, so far had he removed our transgressions from us. So David was showing appreciation for removal of transgressions. Also, King Hezekiah in Isaiah 38, 17, uh, he said, you have thrown all my sins behind your back. Another example of an uh, individual being appreciative of the Lord and his redemption of sin. Also, a prophet Micah in Micah 7, 19 he describes Jehovah as treading our iniquities under his feet and casting the residue into the sea. It's a, another example of a type of figurative language, but it's uh, meaningful to us about God's great grace. The New Testament equally is vivid uh, in its characteristics of uh, pardon. Uh, when one turns to God in obedience, his sins are blotted out. We see that one example in Acts, the third chapter, verse 19. It says, Repent, therefore, and return that your sins may be wiped away on, in order that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord. Greeks use this term of washing out as an example of or blotting out, same concept, when they would use, uh, remove ink from the uh, papyrus sheets that are, was used for writing, and they'd have to remove the ink. Uh, and they use that term in relationship to blotting out that ink. Scripture uses the word redemption as an equivalent uh, word for forgiveness. In Ephesians, the first chapter, verse 7, he says, In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace. So the word redemption is oftentimes used in uh in light of the using the word forgiveness. Redemption originally had to do with buying back a slave for, from his captivity. Uh, in the New Testament, it suggests an offer of freedom for the consequences of sin on the basis of Jesus' atoning death. The Lord presented a blameless sacrifice or blemless sacrifice uh, in our behalf. The idea of forgiveness stirs the soul and has some 
intriguing implications that we could look at. First, forgiveness might imply that there was an offense created or an offense was committed. If there's no breach of propriety, no forgiveness is needed. The fact that humans demand forgiveness at times, therefore they suggest that the person has committed offenses against the Creator. But if there is no, uh, as I said, no breach of propriety, then there is no need for forgiveness. But the, the concept of forgiveness would involve a standard of conduct that has been violated. Uh, The Bible would address both these matters in one verse. Uh, We could see in 1 John, the first chapter, or excuse me, 1 John, the third chapter, verse 4. Everyone who practices sin also practices lawlessness, and sin is lawlessness. Second, forgiveness implies a personal inability uh, to remedy the violation of the law. In one of the parables, if you remember, uh, there was a man that had a great debt owed to him. Uh, He pleaded with the man, if you look in Matthew, the 18th chapter, verse 25, is where this account takes place. He pleaded with his master to forgive him, and the master had pity on him and uh, actually gave his gave up uh, the debt that he owed. Uh, we look at the figure, and it said it would be something like $10 million that he forgave this uh, individual in today's uh, values. But the story continues, if you remember that slave that was given uh, freedom from his debt, he went down to an individual that owed him some money that was a smaller amount, something like $18, uh, and he demanded that he pay him, and the guy pleaded with him, and he would not accept him uh, his pleadings, and uh, actually threw him in prison. Well, the master found out how he had treated this man, and of course you remember this story. Then he he called in an, an evil uh, slave, and that he would be cast into prison himself. So we have to understand. I think this is one of the big problems we have with forgiveness. We want to be forgiven, but we struggle at times about being forgiving in our lives to other people. And so this is the struggle that we, we deal with. Can forgiveness be conditional? Uh, is it possible for one to forgive and yet the forgiveness be, be conditional? Uh, I think it is a possibility. It is a case that God absolutely is good and he forgives conditionally. Then forgiveness may be imposed conditionally with no forfeiture of ethical principle. There's no better illustration of this than the the idea uh, that was on the cross when Christ was on the cross. He said, Father, Forgive them, for they know not what they do, in Luke 23, 34. Did God at that time forgive them, uh, the Jews, unconditionally? I say no. Uh, This is evidenced by the account in Acts 2, because Peter charged Hebrew people at that time, uh, you by the hand of lawless men did crucify and slay the Christ. In Acts 2.23, and concerning those sins, the apostles subsequently would say repent in 2.38. It is obvious 
one need not repent of sins already forgiven. So there, they were. Peter admonished them, uh, even to the point in Acts two thirty eight, be immersed every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission or forgiveness of your sins. So the promise of forgiveness to those folks uh, due to dealing with the death of the Messiah was conditional. God is willing to freely forgive us in Romans 6, 23. We can see that for the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus. So we have that that promise, but he's willing, as we say, he's willing to forgive, but there must be an expression of genuine faith in doing what's required to be forgiven. It's perfectly obvious when a child of God becomes lax, when we become lax, when we transgress uh, the transgressions of the Father's will, the pardon to us is still conditional. And the idea being in 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins. That little word, if, if we confess, then we have, so he's faithful and righteous to forgive us of our sins. So little words, sometimes uh, we've gone over that before with different things, different verses, and there's connecting words and words that set up conditions. In this case, if is a two-letter word that uh, is conditional. There are two kinds of forgiveness that I mentioned earlier. Uh, we... We see some that are we would consider vertical forgiveness from God to us. Uh, there's also a, probably you could describe it as a horizontal forgiveness to extend to one another, each other. Uh, in the model prayer that is oftentimes cited in Matthew 6, 9, it says, Our Father, forgive us our debts, which is a vertical forgiveness as we also have forgiven our debtors, which is a horizontal forgiveness. Paul encouraged the Colossian saints they ought to be forbearing to one another, forgiving each other. Uh, if I had a complaint against any, even as the Lord forgave you, so also do ye. So the, the point he's trying to make is the idea of the forgiving of each other, uh, as the Lord has forgave you, then you also ought to do the same thing to your fellow man. Can human beings forgive sins? That's oftentimes a question that has come up. Uh, the Lord, uh, in Mark, the second chapter, verse 2, uh, there was an idea uh, expressed there by some of the Jewish people who can forgive sins but one even God. Uh, so the question was act, asked, and the fact is they were correct. Only God can forgive sin. God can offer pardon. Uh, a man can't do that. He can't uh, say to a person that stole his car that I forgive you and everything's taken care of. Uh, sin is against God and has to be addressed to God at that point. Psalms 51, 4, uh, it says, Against thee, thee only, I have sinned and done what is evil in thy sight so that thou art justified when thou dost speak and blameless when thou dost judge. So that was a plea there that I've sinned against the Heavenly Father. 
It's alleged sometimes that Christ granted apostles the right of forgiving sins. In John, the 20th chapter, verse 23, uh, the passage really does not provide that uh, support. Uh, It just indicates that sins are forgiven by the Heavenly Father. Uh, If we read that passage, it says, Whose sins you declare to be forgiven must be those forgiven already by God. So the apostles didn't have uh, the ability to forgive sins. Uh, Probably the correct view of that passage is demonstrated by the narrative in Acts, the second chapter. Uh, There, in case the Lord's apostles did not personally forgive anyone, rather they merely proclaimed a condition of pardon. God himself bestowed the actual forgiveness. So in what sense do we forgive one another? Our forgiveness of each other has to do more with our attitude than a specific act. Let's look at some possible principles which can highlight the sort of how we must cultivate our life and be more Christ-like in in forgiving. The forgiving person does not attempt to take revenge upon those who have wronged him. In Romans 12th chapter, verse 17, says, Never pay back evil to anyone. Respect what is right in the sight of all men. So that apply the concept of uh, we don't take revenge against someone that has wronged us. The forgiving person, such as ourselves, should not hate the offender. Rather, in spite of the person's evil, uh, he should show a a type of love uh, not to, to... uh, oftentimes referred to as agape love. It's, it's a love that binds us together as Christians. Uh, we don't want any wrong to necessarily uh, happen to uh, people that's offended us. So we, we still have a feeling for those people and we shouldn't uh, hate them. Let's look at First John, the third chapter, verse 15. We covered some of this in some of our previous lessons here on Wednesday night. First John, the third chapter, verse 15. Everyone who hates his brother is a murderer, and you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. Very plain statement there that would imply that we, we don't have a, a right to hate our brother. Also in 1 John, the fourth chapter, verse 20, says, someone says, I love God and hates his brother. He is a liar for the one who does not love his brother whom he has seen cannot love God whom he has not seen. So this is something we must uh, realize. We don't have that right of of." Oh, hating the offender. A forgiving person is kindly disposed and tenderhearted toward his adversary. Ephesians 4.32, and be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving each other, just as God in Christ also has forgiven you. Of course, we know what the word kind means, but what does the thought of tender-hearted, how does that play into that overall concept of forgiveness? Compassion? Uh, Trying to understand what's occurred, uh, allow your heart to be touched by their uh, conflict that they have in their life and the things they've caused. So it's important for us to uh, show that in our forgiveness. 
A forgiving person is approachable. What does that word mean, approachable? Oftentimes we run into situations where we realize that uh, we're not able to talk with an individual. They're, you know, they just, it's a, a difficult situation for us to uh, try to uh, uh, improve the situation. And so if a person's not approachable, it, it really shuts the door on uh, any kind of reconciliation. So if he is approachable, it opens the door and reconciliation is able to take place uh, and it, uh, we have the welfare of the transgressor in mind. Another area of forgiving person is not merely passive in waiting for the offender to repent. He actively seeks the repentance of the one who wronged him. We look at Matthew, the 18th chapter, verses 15 through 17. And if your brother sins, go and reprove him in private. If he listens to you, you have won your brother. How many times have we heard people, and we may have been guilty of ourselves, I'm waiting for him to come to me to ask for forgiveness. That verse doesn't say that. It says for us to go and take care of the situation. And so we have to, we have to be very careful at times uh, how that can affect our the ability to forgive when we are waiting for that person to come to, you, come to us and to ask for forgiveness. We need to step forward and try to resolve the situation. That's right. It's a good point. It's uh, oftentimes we find ourselves wanting to take revenge, and we we want to win the battle or whatever the situation is. We feel like it's our place to be the winner out of the situation. And there's no winners out of those situations. As uh, Herschel pointed out, we, we have to be concerned about their soul and our soul and how we react to that. In Luke 17, 3, he says, if your brother sins, rebuke him. If he repents, forgive him. Another word that sometimes we don't use very often, what does it mean to rebuke someone? Okay. Make him aware of the situation. Sometimes people may re be in a situation and they're not aware that they've done anything. And so it's, it's an enlightenment to them to realize that, hey, maybe I've offended someone. But as Steve says, you call them to task and say, you know, you, you did something here that I feel like you've uh, hurt me in a way that uh, I need to uh, make you aware of it. We may not rebuke our brother for sin he has not committed, nor may I forgive him of a sin which he refuses to repent. Uh, we may ask our question, does this conflict with what we've said beforehand? Uh, I don't think we uh, have a conflict there. Uh, while one is to cultivate the disposition detailed earlier, he is not at liberty to simply dismiss his brother evil, thus freeing him, as it were, from his obligation to make things right with God. The offender still must be held accountable for his conduct. Forgiveness from the heart 
is another point along these lines I want to address. Jesus cautioned us that we can expect pardon from God only when we are willing to extend forgiveness to others. Matthew 18.35 And there's a difference between lip forgiveness and heart forgiveness. Uh, We may say we forgive. I've heard that statement before. I forgive, but I can't forget. Well, that's not really forgiveness, is it? Uh, Example that we might think about is uh, a person, uh, a woman possibly whose son was brutally murdered, struggles with the question of how to try to forgive this person that killed her son. It's disrupted her life. Uh, Hopefully few of us will ever have to face this challenge. But what can we say to help her with this problem? You know, if you remember here last year, there was a gentleman that was killed accidentally by a a lady cop in Dallas. And uh, make long story short, at the trial, uh, the, the man's brother came up to her and expressed forgiveness to her. And uh, it was quite, you know, it was uh, for her to, or for him to actually take that step forward and express that to her. I'm sure it made him feel better and made the the girl that mistakenly shot uh, the man by accident, if you remember the story. But what can we say to people (laughs) to help them to be able to forgive Uh, I think the idea of forgiveness doesn't mean that we ignore the sin as such. Uh, There are still consequences that have to be uh, involved in what was done. Uh, The killer can obtain pardon from God through obedience to the gospel. As Saul experienced uh, on his conversion in Acts 26.10, he actually made the statement that he had done various things. He says, and this is just what I did in Jerusalem. Not only did I lock up many of the saints in prison, having received authority from the chief priests, but also when they were being put to death, I cast my vote against them. So Saul confessed that he was guilty of uh, things that, uh, even to the death of Christians. And so we don't dismiss he still was guilty of that, but when he was... uh, Converted, the Lord knew that he was uh, going to be a a powerful preacher for his cause. So he was forgiven. Yeah. Okay. There are some truths that we may help us to cultivate the type of compassion and forgiving spirit that God wants us to have in our lives. Uh, As we've already mentioned, we must take note of the value of the human soul, any soul, every soul. Uh, Matthew 16, 26 or what will a man be profit if he gains the whole world and forfeits his soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? So our souls are important. Uh, we, we see in 1 Corinthians 8, 11, for through your knowledge, 
He who is weak is ruined, the brother for whose sake Christ died. So Christ died for all souls. There's uh, those that are uh, in this particular account, uh, as you said, the Lord died for all mankind. First Timothy 2.6, uh, who are we to be selective with regard to those we are willing to forgive? Uh, man has struggles with that. He, he, uh, he may feel that he can forgive some people and some other people he can't forgive. Uh, but who is it to, for us to, uh, why is it uh, give us any authority to be selective in who we're going to forgive? So, some sins have greater uh, consequences than others. Uh, we use the example murder uh, as opposed to possibly a shoplifter. But it's still a violation of God's will, uh, James noted this uh, idea in James 1.15. Uh, then when lust is conceived, it gives birth to sin, and when sin is accomplished, it brings forth death. So it doesn't matter what sin there is, uh, we can say there's uh, more, we use the word terrible, uh, more uh, serious sins, but to God, all sin is need to be addressed. Uh, in fact, if we think about it, if we look at several uh, verses, First uh, Corinthians the sixth chapter, verse nine through ten. First Corinthians six. It's a kind of a culmination of of number of sins there that are listed. First Corinthians 6, 9 through 10. Do you not know that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither fornicators, nor adulterers, nor adulterers, nor infeminate, nor homosexuals, nor thieves, nor the covenants, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindler, swindlers shall inherit the kingdom of God. So there's no distinction there against one being worse than the other. They're all grouped together as being a sin. It's in violation of God's will. We must realize how disappointed the Lord is at times when we act and sometimes we we actually would minimize our own blunders and maximize the mistakes of others. And so we, are, we have to be careful. Uh, we shouldn't speak evil of no man not to be contentious, but to be gentle, showing all meekness toward all men. For we also once were foolish, disobedient, deceived, serving different lusts and pleasures, living in malice and envy, and hating one another. That's in Titus, the third chapter, verses 2 through 3. Terrible, it is rather a terrible thing when we forget the many sins in which we've been forgiven of. We must learn to forgive because do otherwise it's harmful to our very state of mind. It's even our physical well-being. Uh, it was noted a, a doctor, he had written a book, A High Cost of Getting Even. He says it shows the bitter, unforgiving spirit can bring much stress and de de distress to both the mind and the body. Forgiving can be a matter of life and death. So, you know, we know a lack of forgiveness would de definitely be a spiritual death, but he's talking about even the physical body uh, suffers when we're not able to forgive. We must master the art of forgiving for 
others' sake as well as for our own sake. Uh, we must learn that uh, this idea of how important forgiveness is in a Christian life and that it's something that just has to be handled properly and handled in accordance with God's will and that it will be uh, a great benefit to us in our Christian life uh, if we understand that. Um, as I've said, it's uh, something we must uh, learn to understand that forgiveness is important for others' sake, but it's for our own likewise. Hurriedly gone through uh, several of these verses and thoughts, but I hope it kind of gets us thinking again about the importance of forgiveness uh, in our lives and uh, the, the concept that's involved with it. Appreciate the opportunity to uh, share that with you tonight. Good evening, everybody. They've all have been able to make it out. I want you to, all of us, to remember that we're scheduled to begin our Sunday morning Bible class uh, this Lord's Day at 9 a.m. And if uh, things with COVID continue to progress as they have in a positive direction, then uh, before too long, we'll be uh, starting back with the Sunday evening worship. So just be, we're hoping that, that that's going to uh, all come to fruition, but we shall we shall see. Um, also, I want you to remember the book of Esther, the study that's going on uh, that we're placing on the YouTube channel, and you have an opportunity to do that. Um, uh, it's an excellent book. I enjoyed a great deal working through it, and a um, whole lot of work goes into producing those things, and so uh, I would urge you to avail yourself of that. Uh, everybody's encouraged to continue to observe the public health protocols, one of which a number have done tonight, and that is stay home if you're sick. You, know, you shouldn't have to say that, but some people, bless their heart, they'll drag themselves out and infect the whole county. Um, and, uh, and our folks are not doing that. We have a number of people uh, that are home uh, now. Think with me for just a, a few brief moments. Uh, on Wednesday night, what we're having and what we've always had are, by and large, people that are faithful in their service to the Lord, and we're grateful for your presence. So I've been trying to concentrate on uh, just emphasizing one point of doctrine. That we'd all uh, be in agreement on, but it's good to emphasize it and reemphasize it. In Matthew 9, at verse 9, the text says that Jesus went on from there and he saw a man named Matthew sitting in the tax collector's booth and he said to him, follow me. And he got up and followed him. And though it doesn't specify it right there in that context, Jesus called Matthew for the same reason he called Peter and Andrew. He said, you come follow me. Same reason. What's the reason to go out and preach the gospel? What, is he, what he's saying to them is come follow me to work. And when Matthew heard that call, he abandoned the, the post at the tax collector's table. And uh, historical material tells us that that was a pretty lucrative job. Of course, you're going to be hated by everybody in the community, but that it was a pretty lucrative job, even if you did it as you're supposed to. They were agents of the Roman Empire. And for that reason, they're considered traitors among the Jews to their own people. But he left that job immediately without hesitation, without reservation, and came to work with Jesus. And the point, of course, is not that we have to quit our secular livelihood, means of livelihood, in order to serve Jesus. That's, that's not the point because we know Paul told the brethren in Thessalonica that they were to follow his example of working night and day in order to avoid being a burden on anyone. And that if anyone was not willing to work, he said, then they're not to eat either. That's in 2 Thessalonians 3, verses 7 through 10. And regarding one's physical work, Paul elsewhere wrote, whatever you do, do your work heartily as for the Lord and not for men, Colossians 3 and 23. So we must uh, 
look at that and discern what's being talked about and what's being talked about is the need to put our service to God first, just like you're doing tonight, to put that before all things because there are a lot of distractors in the world in which we live. I don't need to tell you that. You know it. Many distractors. Jesus and his calls have to be first. There was a man that Jesus told a parable about. about. He was a rich landowner. He had been highly favored by the Lord. But the Lord ended up describing him as a fool. And the reason he said that about the man was that he had neglected his own soul in order to just exclusively focus on secular matters, matters of this world. He's got a big operation going. He needs to devote some time to it, clearly. But not at the, not at the expense of his soul. In Luke chapter 12, beginning at verse 16, he says he told him a parable saying, the land of a rich man was very productive. And he began reasoning to himself, saying, what shall I do since I have no place to store my crops? Then he said, this is what I'll do. I'll tear down my barns and build larger ones. And there I'll store all the grain in my goods. And I will say to my soul, soul, you have many goods laid up for many years to come. Take your ease, eat, drink, and be merry. And God said to him, you fool, this night your soul is required of you. And now, who will own what you have prepared? So is the man who stores up treasure for himself and is not rich towards God. That's what's important for us to hear. So is such a man. What's he saying? Have priorities. As disciples, we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for, God, uh, for good works, which God prepared beforehand so that we would walk in them. In Ephesians 2 and verse 10. As we serve the Lord, we are to do all in the name of the Lord Jesus. That is by his authorization. Do it for him and not as to men. We have many multiplied responsibilities in this life. And the Lord expects and requires that we meet every legitimate responsibility that is given to us. But he expects and requires especially that the work we do in the cause, the work we do for the Lord Jesus Christ is first before all other things. As we leave this place tonight, let's debar, uh, debat, depart. I was trying to say depart and said two other words. Let's depart with a renewed attitude that we're going to put the Lord's kingdom first. We're going to continue to put the Lord's cause above every other thing. It could be that somebody here tonight has not ever made covenant with Christ, but you are ready to begin the journey of discipleship. And if you've not made covenant with him, I would urge you not to leave outside of Christ because there is salvation in no other name given among men whereby we must be saved. He's it. And if you have not entered that covenant, now is an opportune time. All things are in readiness. And we would be not only willing, but anxious to assist you if you believe Jesus is the Christ and are ready to repent and turn away from sin. Come confess your faith and be buried with the Lord in baptism. Rise up to walk in the new life. And if you're here in one of his and there are some estrangement between you and the Lord or some burden that's too heavy for you to carry and you want us to go with you into the presence of our Lord, we'd be honored to do that if you'd just let us know. Heavenly Father, thank you for allowing us to come this midweek to learn more about you. The parents to forget because you forgive us. Thank you so much for that sacrifice that you did for us, Father. Thank you for the great example that you give us too, to forgive us. And Father, we ask you that you be with who those that cannot be here for any reason, like health problems, Father, we ask you that you be with them. 
We know we have a prayer list, and Father, all of them, we ask in the bring us back, Father. And Father, thank you for the word, the church that you give us, Father. Be with the church around the world, be with the youth, with the elderly people too, Father. And Father, sometimes we fail short of your glory, Father, and we ask you that you forgive us. Help us to preach the gospel and bring others to you. As we depart from this building, Father, we ask you that you take us back safely into the next upon in time. This is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.